working? Okay, uh, can everybody hear me? Good. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for hosting this wonderful event here in Okinawa. Well, today I'm going to talk about uh, my collaboration with uh, Kevin Costero and Ed Witten. So far, we put out two papers on the archive, one in uh, September and another in February. We are now working on a follow-up, uh, I myself and Kevin Costero, on part three and part four. The difference between the part one, two, and three, four is that the first two papers discuss integrable lattice models, while else the last two discuss integrable field series, quantum field series. So what I'm going to do today is to explain the contents of parts three and four in such a way that the connection to the first two papers is manifest, so that you get the overall picture of what's happening now. So let me begin with the description of the integrable lattice model in our framework. In integrable lattice models, a useful characterization of integrability is the Jan-Box equation. And the Jan-Box equation says that uh, the product of R matrices, which are denoted Rij, uh, taken with the different orders are the same. So this is the standard Jan-Box equation. And in the discussion of integrable models, we need extra ingredient which is the spectral parameter. So these spectral parameters, which are represented as Z1, Z2, Z3 here, are associated with lines, and the R matrices depend on the spectral parameters, on the difference of these spectral parameters. And there is a standard story in the integral model literature that if you can solve the Jan-Bach equation with the spectral parameter included, that ensures that there are infinitely many commuting conserved charges and tensor series integrable. And the big question is how to understand this equation conceptually. Now, there is a very simple idea. But first of all, suppose that there is a series topological along this direction. And you can regard these lines as one dimensional defect. And then you can move these lines around, et cetera, uh, to move the, the picture on the left to the right. This almost works, but not quite, because uh, when the three lines collide at a single point, the things become singular. But there is a good way to modify uh, this uh, story by incorporating extra directions. So here, I have the two-dimensional direction. So this is the original two directions which I was talking about before. And there are three lines, like a line-like defect. But in addition, I have the transverse two manifold, the curve, which I denote C here. And suppose that each line defect is located at a particular point on this curve C. Then this helps the story because when you move these lines around, it looks like that these three lines collide, but they are separated in this direction of the spectral curve. So there is no singularity. And in fact, this spectral curve also helps in explaining the spectral parameters. So I said before that the spectral parameters are the parameters associated with these lines. But that parameter is exactly the position of this line in this uh, direction, spectral curve. So this four-dimensional uh, story, where we have a combination of topological direction and the holomorphic direction, naturally explains the, uh, the structures which appeared in the Jan-Box equation with the spectral parameter. Now, of course, if you want to discuss any details, then you should specify which is the four-dimensional four, uh, the four theory. And the Lagrangian for such a four-dimensional theory was written down by Kevin Costero in 2013. And, uh, oh, maybe 12, sorry, I forgot. Uh, <laughs> sorry if I made a mistake. Anyway, um, well, um, so this is Lagrangian. And it's a very simple Lagrangian. So first of all, this is the standard chan simon 3 form. But now we are in four dimensions, so we need one more thing. And that, that is a DZ. Or Z is the holomorphic coordinate on the spectral curve. So it's an unusual theory. For example, uh, this has gauge field has four components, usually, because we are in four dimensions. However, because of this dz wedge term, the, the z, co z component of the gauge field drops out. So we have a three-component gauge connection, whereas the, for, for each component depends on all the four coordinates. This looks like a very peculiar theory, and indeed it is to some extent. However, it turns out that the theory is tedious to a lot of standard uh, uh, chan simon theory, as we will discuss in my forthcoming paper with Cameron. Now, 
uh, there is a parameter called h bar, uh, which sits in front of the Lagrangian. And what I'm going to do is, is to do a perturbative expansion with respect to this parameter h bar. Well, perturbative expansion around what? Well, uh, I'm going to do a perturbative expansion around isolated classical solutions of the equation of motion. And that sounds intimidating, but in practice it's simple. For example, when the spectral curve C is just a complex frame, then we, I'm going to do the expansion around the trivial connection, namely A equal to zero. And then using the standard rules of quantum field theory, I can do a double expansion um, order by order. Um, so uh, now, now we can, we are, we can go come back to the statistical mechanical models. So we prepare a Wilson line. Uh, this is now a layer of Wilson line, uh, integral of the gauge field connection uh, of the four dimensional uh, theory. And then I can make a statistical analysis by uh, putting in many parallel Wilson lines. So here I have chosen the uh, situation where the spectral parameters associated with horizontal and vertical directions are the same respectively. And I denoted that uh, those by Z1 and Z2. So this is the setup. Now I'm coming to uh, integrable field series, quantum field series. Well, there is a nice way to, uh, to start with lattice models and go to quantum field theory, which is to take the thermodynamic limit. So this is the, the same picture as before. But now I can make the lattice spacing smaller and smaller, like this, and even smaller so that I obtain uh, quantum field theory in two dimensions. Now, what happened in the process? Well, previously we had Wilson line, which is the 1D effect. But now I have, to, I have infinitely many parallels then. Uh, in, and in the limit, it fills a two-dimensional frame. So the Wilson line is turned into uh, a surface defect, which is a two-dimensional defect inside four dimensions. And what we have now is a coupled system of starting with the four-dimensional bulk together with a surface defect including. So I would say that this, we have a coupled 4D, 2D system. Now, there are two points. And that actually means that there are two surface defects. This is very easy to see if you go back to the original uh, uh, integrable lattice models. So in the integrable lattice model, there are two different types of Wilson lines, one in horizontal, and one is the, this is horizontal and vertical, located at different points on the spectral curve. Which means that if you take the limit, well, of course, they are, they, they are each turned into surface defect uh, located at different positions, z1, z2. So in this process, we have two surface defects. The question is, what are the difference between the two surface defects? Well, again, if you go back to this uh, discrete lattice models, then it's obvious they spread in different directions, one horizontal and another vertical. And in the language of gauge field, that means that they couple to different components of the gauge field. So here, I have chosen the light coordinate, W and W bar, on this R2. And say, for example, here in this vertical direction, it couples to the W bar component of the gauge field, whereas on this horizontal direction, it couples to the W component of the gauge field. So this is the term in the, uh, this is the Wilson part of the Wilson line, uh, which appears uh, uh, in the original integrable lattice models. And this structure should be preserved even after taking the same dynamic limit. Uh, which means that uh, this thing, the surface defect correspond to located to this point Z1, should couple only to the W bar component, and hence the current should also only have W component. And uh, so, which means that the, the surface, the theory on the surface defect is chiral. You can say the same thing for this antichiral defect, and uh, uh, this the, another defect, and that's going to be antichiral defect. So this is the type of the coupling uh, which one might expect. And there is a factor of H, one of H bar, which I included. And this H bar is the same H bar uh, as in the H bar for the four dimensional bar Lagrangian. So we have one of H bar in front of the whole action of the combined 4D 2D system. Now, I have explained the setup. And we arrived at the coupled 4D 2D system, one chiral and another antichiral defect. And once you allow this understand, you can forget about the uh, integrable lattice model structure and just study the system. But I haven't asked the, uh, answered the fundamental question of why the system is integrable in any sense. There is a simple answer. So let's define this L, L of Z, uh, as this thing. 
So this is just a W and W bar component of the gauge field. But now I'm regarding that uh, as, as a one form in R2, not in the four dimensions. Which means that Z, this uh, coordinate in the extra direction, looks like an auxiliary parameter. So that's, that's I denote what I denote by L of Z. Now, it turns out that this, uh, this operator satisfies a flat connection equation. And this is because if you compute this, and you find that it's proportional to WW bar component of the gauge field, but this is zero due to the equation of motion from the four-dimensional gauge theory. So the four-dimensional theory was chan simon theory, and it's, it's, it's really topological along this R2 direction, which I'm talking about. Uh, so the equation of motion means that the field string is zero. So on shell, it's, it's a flat connection. Now, if you get the flat connection, there is a standard story in, quant uh, in the integral models of producing infinitely many conserved charges, uh, which is to take uh, the path order exponential of this thing. And then, since it's a function of z, uh, you can expand with this, with this parameter z. And each coefficient, which I denote the qn here, creates the law of the uh, conserved charges. So they are typically non-local conserved charges and generate infinite dimension symmetry underlying in uh, integrable models. So this is how you see the uh, integrability, at least classically. Now, in our setup, we can make this a little bit more uh, physical. So namely, this was the expression I was writing. This I had previously L. But L is nothing but the gauge field component uh, along W, W bar direction. Which means that this object, which I'm expanding with, so I define this object, and I'm expanding with this to Z to define conserved charges. This is nothing but the Wilson line. Uh, uh, of the four-dimensional gauge field, but now uh, lapping the S1, where I have we, we start with R2 and then compactified one of the spatial directions to have R times S1. So motto is that, that we have integrable because we have a lux operator which comes from the four-dimensional Wilson line. So in a sense, the, just the existence of Wilson line, which is already in the theory, explains why the theory is integrable. Now, uh, this, this is a setup where we have a coupled 4D 2D system. But of course, you might want to compare with something known. And people use the two-dimensional description. So in order to make the connection, we need to uh, integrate out the fuse along this C, the spectral curve direction. And if you integrate the fuse along this direction, you should obtain some two-dimensional theory, purely two-dimensional theory, uh, which I might call the effective two-dimensional theory. So let's do this procedure of integrating our fuse along the C. In order to discuss this, first one might need to know uh, what are the zero modes along this C. And since the, we have a coupled 4D 2D system, they might come either from 4D or 2D. It turns out that in our setup, uh, it's, uh, uh, we, there are no zero modes coming from four dimensions. And this is because uh, we have chosen the setup in a sense. So we are expanding around isolated solution of equation of motion, which means that there are no modules along C. But you can consider a setup where there are zero modes along the C, and there are 4D zero modes. Uh, but that's known to correspond to some generalization of the Young Bach's equation, known as the dynamical Young Bach's equation. So let me not discuss this. And th therefore, all the zero modes should come from 2D surface defect. The 2D surface defect has its own theory, so they might be zero. Well, they, they have all these uh, degrees of freedom there. Now, at this level, the, the surface defects are separate with each other, and they don't talk with each other yet. However, um, there are uh, in interactions between the different surface defect series because you can exchange the four-dimensional gauge bosons. And this is one of the simplest three-level diagrams you can write down, where this is a chiral surface defect, and the other is the anti-chiral surface defect. Um, so in the chiral defect, there is a coupling to uh, a chiral uh, current. And anti-chiral defect, uh, there is a coupling to anti-chiral defect. And here, I exchange the gauge boson by a propagator. So this is a very simple uh, gauge theory computation. Uh, well, it turns out that this is the only diagram contributing. Uh, sorry, not on the left. Sorry, I forgot to remove this. This is the only diagram uh, contributing to a tree level. Uh, for example, you might think that there might be a uh, vertex in the, in the bulk, 
But it turns out that uh, uh, if, you, if you have couples to anti-chiral defect, you have a w, w, w here. And if you want to contract the indices in between, you need a vertex like a w, w bar. W. So name two w bars. Uh, but there is no such a term in Chan Simon theory. You need a z component here. Anyway, there is a simple di diagrammatics to tell you that uh, the previous diagram, so this diagram, is the only diagram contributing. And you can say that, okay, let's compute it. Uh, but there is a nice way to compute it. Uh, but of course, we did the computation, but uh, there is a nice way to explain this computation. So instead of computing this diagram in itself, let's again go back to integrable lattice models. And then this surface defect came from uh, uh, infinity many parallel Wilson lines. So let's go back to Wilson lines and see what it gets. Um, in this picture, uh, there are two Wilson lines, uh, which are orthogonal with each other. So if you project this picture down to R2, what you get is, uh, is this crossing of Wilson line. And as I explained at the beginning of the introduction, uh, so when two Wilson lines cross, there is R matrix associated with it at the intersection. So that means that this diagram is the first leading correction to this R matrix. Um, so let's uh, see here, I denoted the R matrix of capital R and Z bar, the uh, H bar. And I'm expanding this with this with H bar to, uh, to define the first non-trivial correction. And in integral model literature, this type of expansion uh, is known, and this first leading non-trivial coefficient is known as the classical R matrix. So this means that this diagram, and hence essentially the same diagram, this diagram, is nothing but the classical R matrix, which I denote as small r of z. Now you can write down the effective theory. So first of all, the effective theory obviously has the Lagrangians coming from defects, namely the Lagrangian for the chiral defect and anti-chiral defect. But they talk with each other through this current, uh, together with this uh, small r, which is the classical r matrix. So this is the Lagrangian. Now, uh, you can also convert the lux operator to this effective description. So the lux operator was aw and the aw bar. And in the effective description, it means that there is extra vertex in the box. So you do a similar computation, and you find that this is the lux operator you find in the effective series. Well, of course, once you find the, uh, uh, this explicit lux operator, you can just check yourself that it's, uh, it satisfies the flat connection equation. Uh, by imposing the equation of motion for the effective two-dimensional theory. If you're a little bit skeptic still, uh, I can go to a special case, where the rational case, uh, where the spectral curve is a complex plane. And this classical matrix up to some group theory factor is just the one over z, where z is this part argument here, the spectral parameter. And the Lux matrix uh, we, we, we had reduces to a standard formula known in the literature. Uh, where uh, this thing has a pose at uh, two points, uh, one and minus one, and this corresponds precisely to the location of the surface defect. So, uh, so some of the standard formulas are reproduced in this way, uh, purely from quantum field theory logic. Now, let me discuss a little bit more detail what kind of series we get. And, and a good example is the, well, okay, so of course that depends on what kind of surface defect we consider. But the simplest surface defect is the chiral, anti-chiral, free fermion. And then, of course, we get this thing, but there is a four fermion interactions. And they reproduce the gross nibu type models. And uh, uh, so, uh, so it's, it's the, the simplest case. The defect is completely simple. The free fermion just coupled to the bulk four dimensional gauge field, and it reproduces this theory together with their lux matrix, and hence the integrability. And our framework is sufficiently flexible to allow for various generalizations. For example, I can change the spectral curve from C, complex plane, to C star, or elliptic curve, et cetera. And by just changing the spectral curve means that we go to more complicated integral models. And these correspond to so-called trigonometric or elliptic integrable models. For example, this might impose a theta function. Another generalization is consider a, a surface defect uh, corresponding to the beta gamma system as a surface defect. Then uh, we can reproduce a variety of sigma models uh, from our construction. 
We can also consider uh, multiple defects. Here I have two chiral defects and three anti-chiral defects, and we have some interesting uh, Lagrangian, which is still integrable. Now, uh, well, in the rest of the time, let me come to the issue of quantum integrability. So classically, I explained that the Lux matrix and the theory is integrable, but quite often, such integrability can be broken by quantum effect. And to do, discuss that, we first need to quantize the theory. And obviously, I need to make sure that the anomaly is canceled, which you can discuss, uh, in, uh, assuming certain conditions are satisfied. But let's, for the, in sake of time, let's assume that, uh, uh, that the anomaly is canceled. Then, how to see the quantum integrability? Well, let's come to the classical story. And I said before that locks operator counts because we have four-dimensional views online. Now, I consider a variant of the setup. So previously, I had the, uh, the cylinder and the Wilson line lapping this circle. But instead of that, let's consider flat R2, and then include this Wilson line here, at some point on the spectral curve, different from the location of the two surface defect. So this is just one Wilson line. Uh, but the now point is that we want to regard this operator, uh, this is pass order exponential of this gauge field along this path, as an operator from uh, x equals the spatial direction minus infinity to infinity. So this is operator. Now, why does this help? Let's consider two such operators. Um, now, these are Wilson lines, so you can smoothly, uh, without any problem, you can move this around. It looks like there is a singularity, but just as before, they are located at different points of the spectral curve, so you can move this around with any problem. Or if you move this farther, there, you can say that there is a crossing at infinity, and then another crossing at infinity. Otherwise, it's parallel. Uh, which means that we have this equation. Uh, we have two operators, and uh, it's the same thing, but with different ordering, uh, except that there is a twist correspond to the R matrix. And this equation is known as the RTT relation, uh, the, because we have R and TT. And our TT relation is actually one of the definitions of the Youngians, or uh, the quantum trigonometric if counterpart, uh, which these are the symmetries, infinite dimensional symmetries underlying uh, uh, quantum integrable system. So this explains uh, the our TT relation and why such infinite dimensional symmetries are present. And the final remark is that uh, this relation, uh, again, it's useful to go back to integral lattice models and what the counterpart is. You go back to integral lattice model, instead of, again, surface defect, we just have one Wilson line. And this is the, and we have the exactly the same type of relation, uh, TT equals to RTT. And, uh, and this relation is known as the uh, same name, RTT relation, but for discrete uh, integrable lattice models. And you can read this picture literally by, well, there are Wilson lines and smoothly move it around. Uh, just as I explained at the beginning. But now I'm in changing the interpretation uh, that namely, this Wilson line, horizontal Wilson line, is regarded as an operator acting on the state on this vertical Wilson line. And that's how you extract the generator. And this is what we discussed in part two of our paper. So well, the, the discussion argument for quantum integrability, which we provided in part four of our paper, uh, can be thought of as a continuum uh, field theory version of what the, the RTT relation discussed in part two. And our Foley framework uh, is sufficiently flexible and says uh, uh, a lot more. Uh, and for, for example, some local conserved charges as opposed to non-local charges, which I mentioned, and also renormalization group pro and other things. And for all these details, please wait for our paper, uh, which I hope you appear soon. And so here's the summary. Um, so uh, the, the, the thing we want to discuss is the integrable lattice model or integrable field series, quantum field series in two dimensions. And while well, people typically look at these things and then discuss a lot of interesting structures, and that's amazing that there are so many wonderful results have been obtained so far. But my point here is that instead of looking at here at the purely two-dimensional object, it's very useful to go to four dimensions where we have this vector curve. And the, spectral, the presence of the spectral curve geometrizes some of the information and makes conceptually clear many of the ingredients and seems to uh, you need this out uh, in integrable uh, lattice models and integrable field theory. 
So this is the end of my talk, and usually I end my talk by saying thank you uh, or arigato gozaimasu. But uh, here, this is a conference in Okinawa. So I think I should thank you in the local language, uh, which is Nifei Deviru. Thank you. Yeah, very good talk. Uh, so question time. I'm a little confused about the defects. So you yes. had horizontal defects giving chiral uh, Yes. and have vertical lines giving you the antichiral one. Yes. But I could have imagined an angle, mm -hmm. and so I would get a family of defects labeled by an angle. Yes. And so that means that, first of all, you can go from chiral to antichiral continuously. Yes. 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 And secondly, you can have all of them together. Mm -hmm. What would it mean in your language? Yeah, you let's to... see. So the, I, I motivated, uh, well, well, I will talk specifically about chiral antichiral defects because I want to explain things in such a way that the connection to lattice models and field series manifest. However, the story I present itself uh, works for, a, in fact, very general class of defects. So, namely, the assumption that the defect is chiral or antichiral was not necessary. So, you can just start with the 4D theory with various defects inserted, chiral, antichiral, or even loaded. So, what, what happened? What do you get in field theories? What kind of field theories do we get? Because the one was yeah. Z and one was Z bar. If I yes. get different angles, 45 degree, mix them with that. Right. Uh, what kind of. Yeah, so that, that's, that means that there is going to be. So, when you, when you compute that, that changes the sum of the computations. For example, suppose that it's a completely non chiral defect, like a, you can couple to free, free boson, for example. And then that means that there is a, 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 a W and W bar component, the gauge field couples to that. And that means that there is a new, uh, new, new Feynman, Feynman diagram you should sum up. So some of the, the expression for the two, effective two dimensions that I presented is specifically for that chiral anti chiral defect, but there is a generalization for but non chiral defect. My question is are these, known, new, are these known or new integrable quantum systems? Well, uh, the, uh, well, I believe that they are new integrable models, but there is uh, so much literature in integral field theory, so probably I need help from some people in the audience as to, as to the question of why some of the constraints. But it looks like that the constraint, yeah, in fact, almost all the theories, you can take any, almost any 2D surface defect and couple it to four dimensions, and it seems to give, well, they, they do give integral models, certainly classical. It's a little bit subtle, more quantum mechanical, and there seems to be new. Uh, but to declare if it's new or not, I, I think I need more confidence as to the literature. Uh, you, you, you mentioned curve beta gamma systems uh, on the surface defect. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't hear the first part. Curve beta gamma systems? Yes, that's right, yes. Yeah. So is there any restriction on the kind of target space you can consider? Oh, yeah, that's right. Well, first of all, the first comment is that uh, if you have a, a classical, if you have wor wor only, uh, worry only about classical integrability, there are very few restrictions. Well, you need a Hermitian matrix, et cetera, and uh, that's a requirement. Well, strictly speaking, we have some technical conditions. I'm not completely sure if you can realize all the, all the target space with the Hermitian matrix, but uh, almost oh, sounds looks almost like that. Now, if you come into quantum case, and then uh, there are obstructions. For example, uh, there is a, a first Pontryagin class anomaly associated with the uh, beta gamma system, which people discuss. Uh, so, uh, so, so there are some obstruction for quantizing the beta gamma system. And, uh, and that's reflected there. And a good example is the CPN model. So CPN model, where n is two or greater, uh, is known to be classically integrable, but uh, people, Russia and others, sorry, um, there are a lot of many people contribute to subject, but uh, uh, the, the, uh, a lot of people uh, have studied that in the 70s or maybe 80s or so, and, and then found that they're, they're not integrable, quantum mechanically. And that questions the fact that the uh, beta gamma system with the target space CPN uh, has this uh, obstruction and two quantization. So that's the quantization for quantizing the surface defect itself. Now, there's an extra condition coming from quantizing the whole coupled for the 2D system, and that puts some, for example, then that puts some restrictions on what kind of uh, defects you can put on. And that gives extra conditions. So it's a little bit subtle. And I still don't have a complete story yet. Uh, but I can, in principle, I can analyze it one by one. Yes. So, 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 so one more question. So the spectral curve that you have considered so far is flat, right? So it's yes. a complex plane, the yes. cylinder, right. and, yes. and, 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 yes. and the torus. Yes. So you're talking about higher genus spectral curves, yes. and that's, that's curved. Yes. So do you need to modify the theory to make it holomorphic in those two directions? Well, let's see. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting question. And in fact, uh, one of the things uh, uh, we, well, in fact, we argued in the part one, and one of our paper that these three are the only possibilities. And, and the reason was the follow. So uh, you can try to well, replace this uh, DZ, the one form, by another, in general, one, some one form. So some general down form, let's call it omega, which is Simons. And there we argue that uh, in order to uh, have a well-defined uh, 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 
uh, if, well, well, we, we, we will define the uh, problem of solving, well, let's see, we need an elliptic boundary condition for the classical equation of motion, and that picks up the, uh, imposes the condition that there are no, uh, uh, no zeros to this one form, and that uniquely fix the three possibilities. However, uh, there is a way to modify the condition uh, by, uh, by slightly tweaking the boundary, uh, boundary condition. And, uh, and that's discussed in part three of our paper, and with that, we can now realize the, uh, some uh, uh, two-dimensional quantum field theory examples of the models with higher genus spectral curves. Uh, I know that there are some works uh, by, for example, uh, Krichba, Nov Novikov, and other people about such things, and those might be related. Uh, but that, that, those examples are peculiar, but have interesting connection to Hitchin system, for example. So I think it's a very interesting study then. So uh, when you were talking about the, the quantum field theory, um, you, uh, you were on the plane, so you were in infinite volume for the two-dimensional quantum field theory. Uh, well, so let's see. Yeah, in fact, uh, the, the spectral curve direction. So we, in, when we discuss the effective theory, in fact, we need to add the infinity uh, so to the spectral curve to, so, so that it becomes a sphere. And then the dimensional reduction uh, along, the, uh, along that direction. So that's how, what we do. Can you put the, uh, f the effective theory in finite volume to compute the spectrum and so on? Oh, let's see. Well, uh, we haven't really computed the spectrum or things like that. I mean, to explain the integrability in itself was the uh, most conceptual thing. But the, but the, R, the R2 direction where the integral uh, field theory is defined, it can be taken to be finite, uh, if it's an infinite direction, so just R2. In some discussions, uh, for example, when I discuss some const particular construction of lo you know, local charges, et cetera, I, def I compactify one of the directions. But for the most part, it's just uh, 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 yeah, non-compact R2. Well, of course, you can try to do other things, like imposing boundary condition, and then see what is the meaning of that in our framework, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of interesting questions. And, uh, and for, for example, if you have boundaries, there is a generalization of the Yambach's equation, uh, known as the RKK, KKR relation. So anyway, so, uh, so there are a lot of interesting things which you can discuss. But uh, uh, so far, I'm busy finishing wrapping up the story. Thanks. Okay. Two more questions? Okay, so let's close uh, the morning session and, uh, and then let's thank all the speaker this morning. Thank you. Thank you.